Welcome to another CME session from SJMC. We hope you enjoy the content. to the 25th Grand Round from uh, Subang Jaya Medical Center. I'm your host, Ketua Docs, who prefers to remain anonymous, so that's my avatar. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my colleagues uh, who will appear now. Okay, and the chairperson is Dr. Jayamala. Uh, that's a, she's got the green screen behind. Dr. Cole at the top. Dr. Choi, just below Dr. Jamala, and last but not, not least, uh, Dr. Kanan. So I'm going to switch the slides to Dr. Jamala, so you may present and take over. Over to you. And make it full screen. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen. This is our 25th grand round, and I hope that you all have been enjoying it as much as we have been enjoying it. Now, the topic today is syncope, common diagnostic dilemma. And as usual, we have three cases. I shall present first, then Kanan, and then Ko will wrap up everything. Okay, mine is a 70-year-old gentleman who, as his usual morning walks, six rounds in the park after breakfast and taking his medicine. This has been the schedule for many wee years, they say. On that particular day, while wearing shoes, he slipped and fell on one side, but was okay after that. Denied any head injury or banging his head anywhere, went for his round. After four rounds, he just felt tired, rested on his park bench, and then went home. Slept for an hour, then came down, and while chatting with his wife, suddenly his eyes rolled upwards, arms became stiff, slightly jerky, lasted a few seconds. And after that, he was back to normal. Continued chatting with his wife. An hour later, he had loss of consciousness, but woke up almost immediately. That's when they came to the hospital. He has a past history of diabetes and high blood pressure on Dimecron, Genomet, and Cozar. He walks daily, non-smoker, and that episodes were not preceded by palpitations, chest pains, or difficulty breathing, nothing. So on examination, when he came to ER, heart rate was 54, regular, blood pressure 140, 80, and nothing to find clinically. Uh, as soon as he came to ER, they did a glucometer because he was diabetic, 5.6. The CT head, no bleed. Uh, blood test, essentially all normal. HbA1c 6.6 percent, and his ECG. Uh, Dr. Kanan, would you want to look at his and uh, comment on his ECG? It was repeated twice. This and this, both identical. This shows the right bundle branch block pattern, the left axis, or the left ventricular block. So it shows five ventricular blocks. The rate is also a little slow. Basically, he had bradycardia and a bifascicular block. So what are the differentials you would consider based on the findings so far 
and what would be your next plan of action, Dr. Kanan? I think the key point in this man's history appears to be that she is syncope focus at rest. Principally, it's not provoked. As we have just seen, the ECG shows bifascicular block. Your clinical signs are unimpressive. There's no physical defect that we can see. So it would be very suspicious that his conduction system being abnormal may be the cause of his syncope. So probably he may have an arrhythmia. Now, a probably a pretty arrhythmia. So it's possible that the ECG changes may not have contributed to his problem. Uh, it is just a benign occurrence in the background. So we'll have to think about a neurological cause, cause like an epileptic. So most important initial investigation is going to be monitoring of his heart rate. Initially, we might monitor him in, in a pelvic care unit kind of setting. And if that does not uh, reveal any arrhythmias, we may want to do more prolonged tests. Thank you, Kanan. Well, just like you said, we monitored him in CCU. We had the benefit of an ECG done maybe about five, six years ago. And even then, it showed a bifascicular block. So it was not something new. And as you said, it was seen by the neurologist, EEG normal, MRA brain normal. And at this point, um, Choi, you do a stress ECG, a CT angiogram, or why? What, what would you do? Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, very interesting case indeed. And we, we have uh, here an elderly man with uh, unprovoked syncope, like what Dr. Kanan said. Although the uh, ECG shows a bivascular uh, AB uh, block, uh, naturally one will wonder whether he could have developed a trivascular block, or in other words, uh, advanced AB block. To explain his syncope. Uh, in this case, I think a stress uh, ECG will be good. We provoke the heart by making the heart pump a bit faster and see whether the vesicle the <laughs> gets blocked intermittently or not. So, should he go for a stress ECG and he develop intermittent AV block, his uh, heart rate is faster, that may explain that he could be having underlying advanced AV block and uh, warrants a pacemaker. At the same time, uh, an exercise ECG can also provoke other types of simple uh, etiologies like uh, arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia that may be provoked by exercise. Uh, all of you may actually end up seeing his heart rate being stuck at the rate of 50 or 60 despite running on, on the uh, ball bar, like maybe a whole good uh, 20 minutes. So that shows some kind of sinus nodal incompetency as well. So that could also explain uh, giddiness or even Singapore uh, tech. Um, as for the CT uh, coronary angiogram, it is also important to do it in elderly men with syncope uh, to do for obviously uh, critical uh, coronary artery stenosis, like a left main stenosis that could actually uh, provoke a ventricular arrhythmia uh, being stressed. Anomalous coronaries as well, uh, although quite unlikely to present at this age, so doing a CT will definitely be uh, beneficial. Yeah. Thank you, Choi. His echo was normal. On the stress ECG, he's max, he went up to a maximal heart rate of 144. Uh, about nine minutes, if I'm not mistaken. 95% of maximal heart rate for age. CT and you, non obstructive coronary artery disease. So, really not helpful at, at all. So, so uh, I know you probably may want to answer this later because you have something on this. Uh, but is it something that you would consider with this for this patient? First yes. attack, first single attack. Right. So, uh, always the uh, things that all these heart rate and ECG application is very useful, especially for patients that have been suspected to have intermittent kind of uh, arrhythmias. So I just give a general overview. So nowadays, even with the first attack, it depends how how severe is it. From your symptoms itself, it seems to be quite severe because he has up rolling eyes. Because this means that perhaps there's some long ready or even a non-sustained arrhythmia like ventricular tachycardia that can cause 
the uh, reduced cerebral perfusion causes so-called a seizure kind of activities. Uh. So these are these are red flag sign of syncope. So of course, even the first episode, I'll probably try to filter with uh, advise patient to buy at least a, a smartwatch with a heart rate application. There's of course limitation to it. Now the the first way is sometimes this heart rate uh, watch able to record the lowest heart rate. So even the patient doesn't uh, uh, feel anything, you will show in the, the watch uh, the heart rate about 30 beats per minute at a certain point in time. So that from something. Or the heart rate extremely very fast, like 200 beats per minute, for example. How do you probably record it? And that prompts us for further investigation. Now, the limitation is it's usually not so useful for syncope because when the patient pain is not a likely for the patient to look at her. So it's good for asymptomatic and also symptoms like pre syncope of palpitation. I advise my patient to have some form of ECG patient to point. So this is what his first attack, and we couldn't find anything in the initial investigations. I asked him to get a smartwatch. Okay, so for, he came to see me because he said when he went walking, he felt his head is spinning. But the he, he got his ECG, he showed me, he said it was short sinus rhythm. He didn't lose consciousness. So I just reassured him and sent him on his merry way. Ten days later, he came because after a jog, he rested in his car. He suddenly felt his head was funny, and according to the driver, he had a loss of consciousness for ten seconds. He had a drink and started walking in the park. But after about half a kilometer, he felt tired, sat on the bench, and fainted again and fell to the ground. So the family promptly brought him back to the hospital, and when I saw him. Heart rate was 72. Now, one of the things I realized is that on this man's smart watch, when you have the arrhythmia, you're supposed to press something to record the ECG, and you have to have you know, to record the heart rate and somewhere to record the ECG. When you are collapsed, there's nobody there to press it. So there are limitations for this smart watch. So on this particular model that he had, so I had no choice. I said, you go and do a, put a cardio scan. It's already the second attack. So it was fitted on the 14th, seven day cardiac scan. Three days later, he comes because he says, you know, he felt giddy, no loss of consciousness. And according to his smartwatch, heart rate was 37. So he came when I examined, it was 40 something. He was very well. And Troy, what would you do? I mean, basically he wanted me to stop the cardio scan to analyze the rhythm, what would you do? Well, uh, I think at this point, when we have done uh, most of the tests, with, other than with the, the ulcer, he, we have a gentleman with recurrent fainting spells, quite significant fainting spells. And to me, it looks like the pattern is, uh, is incremental, it's getting worse. So of course, we, we could wait and see longer, uh, I mean, looking at the result before we consolidate our practice. Or I think in this case, it's quite clear cut that he has a very arrhythmic event uh, to experience this Singapore attack. Uh, I would probably uh, face it in, in him, uh, means that uh, face implantation at this point. Okay. So, what I told him was, I said, yes, you know, he's 37, and you may or may not be able to give us what we want looking for. Since you may have been painted and you feel all right, why don't we continue it for seven days? Okay, so he agreed and he came back uh, for review uh, after the seven day cardio scan. Uh, and he says, No, after that, he had no more episodes. He felt clean. So, Troy, would you like to comment about the uh, cardio scan results? Mm. This is uh, indeed a very interesting stream. Uh, this line top, uh, you can actually see a two to one DB conduction in him. So, of course, two to one, we can't tell whether it's, uh, you know, at one, it's like two. But the line, which is interesting, which is basically a flat line, 
either it got disconnected or he actually the heart got disconnected. <laughs> so I think it's actually the latter. Mm. Um, so he had a, a, a very, very long status pause. I'm not sure the total duration, but I guess it's long enough to explain all the above the uh, the Singapore attack and it could be it, it could be hazardous, you know, you could be driving and when the blood it could actually ramp his car into some innocent passerby. So definitely significant uh uh pretty at least. Yeah. <laughs> I think the third lead actually came up because he was completely asymptomatic at yeah. this point in time. In fact, he said, I felt great. But the other thing that I wanted to point out is his heart rate was actually 40, 48. On the resting ECG, we all thought it was just sinus ready. We could not see the little T waves. Yeah. But I guess in this cardio scan, because it was all came up, you could see it very clearly. Okay. So point is uh, if you look at uh, the strip or hotel especially if you're able to identify the p wave like try identify dr jaya two p wave to one qrs try to look at the sinus rate uh, if you look at this sinus rate uh, it's about 100 how many big boxes three three big boxes about 100 beats per minute if you have a sinus rate of about 100 beats per minute it's very unlikely for the AV node slows down and block because your heart uh, sympathetic is on. But sometimes if you have sinus bradycardia, your AV node can slow down and you can have a two to one block. Um, your heart rate is a bit faster and then you go to two to one block. This tells us that either the AV node is very, very unhealthy or there is a conduction block at a vesicle level. So these are one of the other reflex signs. Okay, so on this particular day, I said he was, he was asymptomatic. Okay, he continued. I mean, this was all he had. On the 19th, he was asymptomatic. He was feeling great. 4.16 in the morning, uh, this is what he had. I think you can see the heart rate was very slow and it was complete heart block. And it continued on at 4.16. He had a long period of ventricular standstill. All three were flat. So he had a ventricular standstill of about 12 seconds. And he was completely asymptomatic. He's never dead. He was asleep. So I guess this will be one of those that, you know, the patient would never have been woken up to come and review the audio scan. So it is a bit frightening. So this was, I mean, of course, the treatment, he says, Choi said was very clear. Uh, he needed a pacemaker. But the take-home messages for me were a few things. Sometimes diagnosis is not clear-cut. When patients sometimes come to see the doctor, they expect everything to be sorted out on the first visit. It's not possible, especially in some things like this, like syncope, or palpitations, they need repeat reassessments and prolonged monitoring. I'm surprised that they continue to come back and they wouldn't have said lousy doctor and moved away. And the other important thing was symptoms do not always correlate with pathology. I mean, the bad thing happened and he was fast asleep. So, um, well, the apps like smartwatch and all that are helpful. But as I pointed out, it has limitations, particularly when the patient loses consciousness or it's the older age group where they are not so familiar with using these apps. Okay, we shall now move on. Second case, Dr. Kanan. I would like to present Kanan. Case over to you. Thank you, Dad. Present this 62 Indian lady. Now, two months prior to see me, she had three episodes of feeling very faint after climbing steep stairs or when she walked up slopes fast. The symptoms settled with the rest. Next, there was no chest pain or palpitations. She went for regular walking and cycling exercises during which she was asymptomatic. The night before consultation, she had dinner then a, a regular glass of wine, walked up the stairs to use the bathroom, felt unwell, called out to her husband and lost consciousness. 
She said there was no palpitations noted before she lost consciousness. The husband found her unresponsive, could not feel a pulse, and started CPR. There was no splintering incontinence noted, and she woke up soon after. She could walk unassisted assist, by the husband and son and brought to the emergency room. She had no history of diabetes or hypertension. There's no history of epilepsy. She never smoked. The family history of mother required bypass surgery in her 70s. Good question to Dr. Joy. Just based on the patient's history, what possible causes would go through your mind to explain the patient's symptoms? Yeah, so, I mean, like any other therapy, usually we well, divide it to cardiac, neurocardiogenic, or non cardiac. But purely based on uh, symptoms, uh, we know positional state or neurological deficit after the Singapore attack uh, was very brief, and clinically, the husband detected there was no pulse. I more to a cardiac cause and either be a heart rate, heart rate related issue or the pressure related issue, arrhythmic uh, in particular. Uh, so we need to examine the patient so and also further investigation. I think the key point is that this lady gets a syncopal spell related to exertion and it does not appear to come at rest. So clinically, she looks very fit, blood pressure 130 by 80, pulse rate good, volume and tension normal, JMP not seen, no edema, and the heart, there was no clinical cardiomegaly or left ventricular hypertrophy. Of course, I think the sound does, does it stop? Can you hear? Okay, so the word. The left sternal edge, next year. There was a three by six ejection systolic murmur which radiated to the carotid. The rest of the examination was normal. So, Dr. Joy, the next question to you. Based on the clinical examination, what diagnosis would you consider? Uh, thank you, Karen. Based on the I would say almost textbook uh, type of uh, description. Uh, I would say she clinically she has a diagnosis of aortic stenosis. Uh, I mean, based on the systolic murmur, which could be uh, crescendo in, in nature. Um, and in regards to her syncope, uh, if I have a patient with significant aortic stenosis, fainting spell could either indicate a very tight valve, uh, causing output failure, low choke volume, or Maybe accompanying a uh, rhythm related issue as well, like a uh, AV block, the patient with aortic stenosis. That would be my, uh, my suspicion. Okay. I think that's what we would think about. One of the other things we have to consider is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because that can also give rise to a murmur. If you're a very good physician, you'll be able to differentiate, get the upstroke, so on and so forth, and make a differentiation. Hey, Dr. Ko. Next question to you, what investigation would you do? The usual baseline investigation I would order would be the ECG to look for any sign of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, which point to either a severe aortic stenosis hypertrophy or as you said, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in the ECG, what you look for is very high voltage uh, QRS in the precordial leads. Sometimes I will also look for any sign of any uh, uh, history of, I mean, the sign of infarct. For example, a Q wave in the anterior lead. This will tell us maybe this patient have a very poor EF to begin with. Sometimes poor EF can lead uh, arrhythmias cause fainting as well, especially during exertion. The second test, the usual baseline test I will do is a cold cardiogram. That will probably uh, give us the diagnosis or differential diagnosis. We look for valve, whether it's calcified and whether there is an increase in the peak gradient across the aortic valve, which would suggest the aortic stenosis. And looking at the thickness of the left ventricular wall, suggest any uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or significant aortic stenosis, which would cause uh, hypertrophic uh, changes as well. 
Uh, this is uh, a patient ECG. Would you like to comment of the oh? Yep. So what we can see that there is a ST uh, depression or uh, ST T wave abnormalities over the lateral wall and also interior wall. Surprisingly, it doesn't fulfill the LVH criteria in this patient. So there is no Q wave seen, so there's no history of it. Ah, so this could either point to either the ischemia or the LV or there's a strain in the LV. Sometimes it happens in uh, LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, even without a high voltage. What I think, you would think unlikely would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because there you would expect to see more profound ECG changes. So between the two, I think we would choose aortic stenosis as more likely based on our clinical auscultation. Next please, yeah. So this was her chest x-ray, quite unremarkable size heart. Yeah, okay. next please. Unfortunately, the echocardiogram, the uh, the video doesn't run well. So I'll just show you the Doppler, which shows a very marked uh, aortic stenot, uh, gradient, 336. The normal gradient is somewhere below five, that kind of thing. Okay, and the mean, uh, mean gradient was uh, 83, so also very high. Okay. This is flow room. And you can see where at the tip of the arrow, you can see the calcified valve. Let me click the next one there. The next image. The right the side. Both are running. Never mind. It's okay. Basically, at the edge of the arrow, you can see a black shadow, which is the calcification of the valve. And unfortunately, the video is not running. If it runs, you'll be able to see it opening and closing. Now, there you can see. It. Yeah, so that's the calcified aortic bar. Okay, next, please. So, a few more questions to you, Dr. Cole. First part as part of the pre op assessment, a treadmill test has been suggested. Would you do a treadmill test in this patient with severe aortic stenosis? If you would not, why not? Uh, I will probably not do a treadmill test in a patient with a aortic stenosis because it's actually a relative uh, contraindication, if, especially at this, pa uh, this patient where there's a proven echocardiogram of a uh, uh, high pressure gradient across the aortic valve. Sometimes when you stress the patient, the BP will go down, and then it will cause a lot of uh, hemodynamic instability in this patient. And uh, most of the time, it, for severe aortic stenosis, when they start having symptoms, prognosis is actually quite poor unless being treated accordingly, which is aortic valve uh, replacement. And all these patients actually indicated we have a pre-op coronary assessment before the surgery. Uh, question number two, uh, if I see this patient with a low heart rate, I'll be a bit worried. Uh, as you can see, the calcified bar uh, in the yeah, in the in the proroscopy, you can see the very calcified bar, the aortic area. Actually, it's just next to the atrial ventricle and his bundle area. So if you have a very dense calcification there, most likely it will impinge. Uh, so involve uh, your, uh, the left bundle branch and the his bundle and the epino uh, as well. So a heart rate that's very low usually indicate either intermittent complete heart blocks uh, that have been happening. So you have to tell the surgeon this because uh, when they go and do the uh, valve replacement, a lot of time they will go to complete heart block, especially if the heart is really low, it's uh, free bring up setting. Now, country rheumatic valvular heart disease is very important, especially in younger patients. Then congenital, but the most common is bicuspid aortic valve. Degenerative uh, valve disease in older people 
and in rare cases you can have rheumatic heart disease or in fact severe hyperlipidemia. Next slide please. So this patient went for valve replacement surgery at which time she was found to have a bivalvular aortic stenosis and critical stenosis as the surgeon said. Now backup aortic valves in the normal aortic valve, we have three leaflets. In bicuspid aortic valves, we have two leaflets, and usually it's because of fusion of the left and right uh, cardiac come. Next. Depending on the presence or absence of redundant tissue, the hematidic abnormality can be either aortic stenosis or regurgitation. The inheritance is variable, but could be autosomal dominant. About 20 to 30 percent of other family members have a bicuspid aortic valve. So this patient, we actually told her to get her two sons screened. And bicuspid aortic valve invariably will degenerate during one's lifetime. So this patient was actually diagnosed about six years earlier, but she defaulted for up. So we need to tell the patient to come back about once a year probably for evaluation. The risk of infective endocarditis is also high among populations with bicuspid valves. Next is there. Yeah. Yeah. There are some associations with bicuspid aortic valves can be associated with coarctation of the aorta. One of the important things can develop is uh, dilation of the ascending aorta because of the jet that impinges on the uh, ascending aorta. This occurs in 40 to 50, 60% of our patients. And 30% of bicuspid aortic patients during surgery will require surgery to replace the ascending aorta. Next. Now, this is a patient that uh, Dr. Jay and I looked after many years ago at the University Hospital. She was 18 years old. She had very severe hyperlipidemia, familiar, and her cholesterol was 600 milligrams. And you can see she has got tendon xanthoma, and she and her sister developed aortic stenosis due to severe hyperlipidemia. Unfortunately, the sister died as she was waiting for surgery. The other girl is still on follow-up. She comes to see both of us intermittently, and she has had her aortic valve replaced. Now, aortic stenosis, life expectancy, with the onset of symptoms, it's about three years. With the onset of heart failure, it's about one year. Next, please. Left ventricular hypertrophy, if it's present, is an independent risk factor for operative mortality. In the passage of time, the left ventricular ejection fraction decreases, cardiac output decreases. Now, the pulmonary artery pressure will increase and congestive heart failure symptoms will appear. Even at this stage, if the patients are caught and valve replacement surgery is done early enough, their left ventricular function can completely recover. Thank you. Moving on to the case three, which is by Dr. Ko. Ko, over to you. All right. So, I have the pleasure to manage this uh, lady, Juan uh, Ariana, not the name. 46 years old, uh, quite a lean body mass, about 40, 45 kg, no known medical illness. She presented actually to the neurologist first because of uh, two fainting episodes, uh, June 2021. Uh, she has loss of consciousness quite long, uh, told by the witness about one to two minutes. So unlike the previous two case, few seconds. So also have uh, up rolling eye, almost a jerky movement. Uh, physical examination are remarkable. There's no murmurs, uh, pulse, uh, blood pressure line standing, there's no discrepancy. So neurologists have seen uh, assessment, EEG, MRI, brain done all normal. And because of the history, it was, uh, maybe I asked Dr. Tanen first, what, 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 what do you think if you, you are the one that see this patient first? As we go through her history and her physical examination, what's uh, apparent is that this lady has got syncope with no critical, abnormal cardiac signs at rest. 
and the clinical, clinical findings are there's no postural hypotension. She has got a normal heart rate, no heart murmur. So the possibilities here yeah, could be neurological, some sort of epilepsy, cardiovascular, there's no evidence of obstructive anatomy like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or valvular heart disease, as you saw in the previous patient. A vasovagal syncope is possible, or she could have a paroxysmal bradyarrhythmia, like a thick sinus syndrome, or tachyarrhythmia for things like Brugada syndrome or uh, a ventricular tachycardia. <laughs> yep. So when she first uh, saw me, she referred because she need uh, the neurologist wanted to rule out cardiac causes. The the symptoms from the history is actually I don't think it's provoked because most of the time she was like doing a house chore, so like washing plate, had it just been that. Uh, of course, the most common uh, syncope in general in the young younger age group of patients are the neurocardiogenic uh, syncope. Uh, well known as a uh, vasovagal syncope. Usually it has certain triggers, but this one, this lady, there's no triggers. And of course, cardiac syncope had explained, uh, I mean, illustrated by the earlier two cases, valvular heart disease, if you have ready or even tachycardia, can cause uh, cardiac syncope or channelopathies. Channelopathies means that genetic disorder causing condition like Gerda syndrome or long QT syndrome. The typical thing about cardiac syncope is the loss of functionals usually a few seconds. So this is a bit unusual because it's more than a few seconds. And of course, neurological syncope is the one that usually presented with a longer period of fainting. Uh, you can have a seizure episode involving the temporal lobe or the consciousness level. So you don't see the real jerky movement, but only loss of consciousness. Some migraineous uh, headache can present as a syncope as well. Of course, in the more elderly patient, then you're more worried about it. So this is a young lady. And there's also very rare causes that I think most of us have encountered before, uh, which are pulmonary embolism, hypoglycemia, keratid sinus hypersensitivity, pushing uh, Addison's disease, hypothyroidism. And of course, uh, uh, the history, Physical examination and the initial blood test we go out all this uh, out. So these are the overview of the cause of secret. No, no, Dr. Gannon, uh, knowing that this patient has uh, unprovoked syncope, what is what is the initial investigation of choice? We we'll always start with the ECG to tell us about whether it's any conduction abnormalities or arrhythmia can also give us about structural heart disease, like for example, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that we talked about a moment ago. And things like general parasite brugada, if you have uh, pertinent patterns that you can identify. So in the blood, you want to check the electrolyte because abnormal electrolyte can cause arrhythmias, hemoglobin for anemia. Then you will check for diabetes and thyroid disease. And I think the next test you want to do is the echo. Can tell us about structural abnormalities of the heart. And in treadmill test, we have discussed, it can show a mitral ischemia, which seems a bit unlikely in someone, a young female like this. But we can look for exercise induced arrhythmias uh, that uh, Choi told us a moment ago. We can, uh, particularly looking for chronotropic uh, dysfunction. Of course, the most important test is the halter. And the type of halter we're going to do will depend upon the frequency. So if the patient's uh, attacks are very infrequent, nowadays we've got things like seven-day halter. And I think you guys do implantable loops where you can monitor for six months or even longer. You're spot on. So I think uh, ECG, blood test, echocardiogram, look for all the, the things that mentioned. And uh, Choi earlier mentioned about the treadmill test. Uh, uh, in a young patient, what what you actually look for in the treadmill test? Yeah, just to, uh, we talk about uh, exercise induced pathological AV block. We talk about ventricular arrhythmia induced by exercise. But you know, in this young group patient, quite unlikely. Uh, 
I think it's been well documented as well. Sometimes when you stress a patient really hard on a stress meal, uh, on the treadmill, the young patient with hyper vegatonic uh, state, uh, uh, after running, and in, in response to the sympathetic drive that they have poured in during the excessive running, they may develop some kind of uh, extreme uh, bradycardia. So I'm not sure whether that will be useful in, uh, in some patients. So if I do see uh, severe bradycardia, uh, vagal tonic state, maybe that could explain a little bit of uh, vagal tone for patients. Yeah, I think it's the only time where the stress test we have to be there all the time because uh, sometimes the technician may miss the important finding. Uh, AV block, usually in elderly, you look for that during exertion. Uh, and Choi mentioned correctly, usually the, the money lies at the post recovery period where you can, there are a few things. Like, sometimes you can induce a ventricular arrhythmias, uh, especially in those uh, idiopathic RVOT uh, ventricular tachycardia. You can induce the long QT actually. And long QT is a very dynamic disease. Sometimes this patient may have a long QT syndrome. At rest, the QT may be borderline. So what you look for is to stress the patient out. And then at a recovery period, do another 12 ECG, measure the QT interval. Any QT interval that is more than 480 is very suspicious. And uh, the next slide will show you the example of uh, what you look for. So then you can use a, a particular tachycardia description. And the case report also noted uh, you can induce a Brugada pattern during the recovery period. And uh, I have seen one or few cases of hypervigatonia also. Patient run during the recovery period becomes severely bradycardia as well. So, so these are the times that's why I, the patient until the recovery look for all these uh, signs and symptoms. It's not just, oh, finish stress test, Bali clinic. It's kind of all right. So, I do the what has been explained uh, by Shaw and Dr. Khaled. ECG normal, look carefully and uh, measure the QT interval, looks normal. Any QT interval that is less than 460 is. Echocardiogram is a no perfectly normal structural heart. A stress test, uh, a conduction, a one to one conduction, A to B throughout. There's no sign that I mentioned earlier. There's no PVC, no VP, no long QT, and 24 hours holder, very normal uh, looking rhythm. So that's the issue that we are facing now. Patients have very infrequent painting episode. The 24 hours holder is good if you're able to capture something significant, for example, AV block. A lot of PVCs, for example, I'll give you an idea what next. Now, your fre frequency of single P is like one to two uh, times per week. Then we have to, we can either use a prolonged photo monitor. Nowadays, it's available as a patch monitor, very convenient. And uh, some sometimes, especially patients with painting episodes, we will uh, encourage patients to wear a look uh, because the uh, only problem when you fail is that you don't have the time to record yourself but the loop recorder the one that used like king of heart it's good that because you keep on looping as long as you wake up you press the button it will relook back at the one three minutes prior to the episode now the question is what if the patient pain less than one to two times per heart every time when she comes you do 24 hour holder one week holder is useless because find mostly normal finding. So these are the time that uh, sometimes we have resort to an invasive, a more invasive kind of uh, uh, diagnostic tool, which is like suitable loop recorder. The next slide will show you the two types of a patch shoulder monitor. Some of you may, may remember Dr. Jaya Mala was mentioning a cardio scan, which is on the right side of the picture, there's a cardio scan. Left side is another brand called the Easy Pro. Both are patch monitor, waterproof, can shower, uh, and then you wear for seven days, and sometimes get up to 14 days. And the below one is the event loop recorder, uh, which can be uh, wear up to uh, 14 days. And any times we feel uh, the patient pain, pain or 
still giddiness, you can press the record, then you look back one to three minutes before the symptoms and you record the uh, rhythm. Interesting, so I'm going to just uh, tell you all what happened in this case. I did a seven day patch monitor. Initially, I thought I wouldn't find anything significant, but what happened is uh, look at this strip at 8 15 in the morning. Very important when you interpret the hotel, you need to make sure patient whether it's sleeping or awake. Because if it's sleeping, this is normal actually. Physiological sinus bradycardia during sleep. Now, at this point of time, the patient actually weak and uh, brushing teeth. And you can see that the, the lower strip there, you can see that it suddenly become very bready. Yeah, yes, correct. And then normal back. And I asked the patient exactly at that at the, on, on, at the point of time. The patient said he will be giddy, but not painted yet. So yes, okay. So there is some clue. Really. This patient might have some form of basovagal neurocardiogenic syncope. So I have to proceed with a tilt table chart uh, test. Maybe Choi can explain what is a tilt table chart test. Especially this patient. So the table test is a basically medical procedure to help diagnose the cause of painting a single fee. Where during this test, the patient is usually placed on a table that is tilted upright, you can see in the picture. And their blood pressure and heart rate will be monitored. Uh, just a note of interest is that the blood pressure monitored will usually be, at least here, bit to bit blood pressure, meaning that any variation with the blood pressure will pick up almost instantly. Uh, rather than using the usual uh, half dynamic. And the positive tilt is uh, seen when the syncope is, is producible. So when the patient faints during a tilt, it could be either because the BP dropped uh, drastically, uh, which we call as a vasodepressor uh, predominant kind of a tilt, or a, a severe bradycardia, like a sinus long, sinus pause, a neural inhibitory. Uh, so when we can reproduce the same kind of syncope and we can relate it to the patient's uh, parameter, uh, that might explain uh, the patient's cause of syncope. Which uh, actually, for people, this patient you mentioned the bradycardia during eight o'clock, right? She was yep. brushing her teeth. Maybe that also triggers a bit of a clinical suspicion. You know, when you brush teeth, huh, you gap yourself a bit, huh? So maybe that, that you know, yes. a very excessive gap response as well. That is why I, I ordered a tilt table test, hoping I can induce some form of uh, positive finding. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, actually, basically, tilt table is trying to provoke a neurocardiogenic syncope. So, yep. Next. The tilt table test actually is negative. Uh, another syncope, you can see in one month, it's like painted about once a month. So, it's very uh, difficult. Uh, luckily, as Dr. Jaya mentioned, the earlier patient. Sometimes we cannot find anything, patient will say, ah, lousy doctor, I cannot find anything. We will just move on to another doctor and another doctor will keep on repeating the same test again and again. Uh, will be uh, negative findings. So what we need to do next is really to get a diagnosis uh, very fast because when it uh, fell backward and injured the head, uh, she actually admitted for some cerebral concussion. She agreed for an EP study. EP study, basically, we have to look for in more depth, whether the patient has any sick sinus syndrome, whether the AV node is functioning properly, and whether the his conduction has any disease. We're also able to try to stimulate any presence of supraventricular tachycardia. Sometimes the uh, SVT with a very high rate, like 220 and above patient can fail, or ventricular tachycardia. But all tests are within the normal range. So an implantable loop recorder was implanted so you can see that nowadays that it doesn't call implanted implantable anymore it's called insertable because it's very small now so that, that was me in 2014 implanting the first smallest uh, loop recorder in IGN that was the first one in Malaysia so it, it's very small it's like uh what about it it's like a microchip embedded under the skin subcutaneously and this can monitor up to three years because the battery span up to three years means that at any point of time, the patient uh, having bradycardia or syncope is able to capture the rhythm part of it. And the more interesting part is 
it comes with a home monitor, meaning that the patient will be uh, provided a home monitor device to plug in the beside the bed. Every time the patient goes to sleep, it's wireless, connected to the uh, home monitoring device. The device every day, as long as uh, the patient is near to the device, it will download the recording strip. If there's any significant recording, it will actually email the company and the company will email to the doctors. So, December 2021, where she felt a bit giddy, even before she felt she come to my clinic, I already get an email trigger. So when I look at the uh, recording, you can see that the heart rate goes suddenly very slow to 30 beats per minute, 20 beats per minute. That's where I have to call her and ask her on 10, 25 a.m. in the morning, what actually happened. The same thing here, if she's a housewife, she just do the normal house chore. She feel a little bit giddiness. Then perhaps I'll, the diagnosis at that point of, point of time in my mind, maybe still a bit of basovagal symptoms that associated with bradycardia. So I will say that just drink more water, make sure you have uh, enough uh, uh, salt, sodium, make sure you keep yourself hydrated. So now this reflex syncope is a very common thing and unfortunately very poorly understood. The brain is activated indirectly or directly by some stimuli. Most of the time is because of uh, uh, pain. As Dr. Choi said, gag reflex also. Visual stimuli like looking at blood. Sometimes you look at blood, some people are of uh, Then you feel chili is reflexing. Micturation single P means that you go to the toilet, time your bladder is full, trying to trigger a bigger response as well. So this results in simultaneous enhancement of actually parasympathetic, which decreases the heart rate and also withdrawal of sympathetic nervous system. So every time when your blood pressure drops, the normal response is your heart rate will go up. Spend it so you won't feel. But in reflex single P, both drop. So the next next uh, click, you will see that. In the field table test, just now Dr. Chai has highlighted, we look for two things actually. Either the patient has a drop blood pressure, which is called a vasodepressive kind of vasovagal syncope, or the drop in the heart rate, which is the cardio inhibitory uh, syncope. So there are different methods of management for this. And a lot of time they fall in between, mixed one. A bit of BP drop, a bit of heart rate drop, that's why the patient feels. Unfortunately, we don't see this in our case. And the reflex syncope management usually are conservative. Just tell the patient, drink a lot of water, make sure you don't get yourself hydrated. And don't dehydrated. Uh, maybe some medication if it's refractory, such as fludocortisone, uh, which will increase the salt uh, absorption in the body. Midodrine is something that actually causes the blood vessels to constrict. So that blood pressure will In older patients, sometimes implanting the pacemaker as a first line does help. Again, this is a very young patient, uh, 46 years old. We do not want to have her to be implanted something when diagnosis is sure at this point of time. Next. Now, just now was December 2021. So, Nothing happened for the next three months. I thought, ah, my advice probably works. She probably hydrated herself, take potato chips or something like that, increase the salt in the phone. Then one day I got another alert. But this alert is a bit more, I, I got a bit more anxious. Uh, how long was your pause, Dr. Jamala, just now? <laughs> sure, my, mine is 24 second pause. Now, you can see that even the, the loop recorder had to pause for a while because the pause is so long. Uh, but it is it, it already recorded down there. 6.39 a.m., although she was sleeping, uh, but actually it's not like I call her. She actually was brushing her teeth, really. And I hit the head. So 24 second pause is something that I have to do something. Now. So no more conservative treatment for her. So next. Now, the, the treatment, all this wrong for cardio inhibitory syncope. Now that I know it's very clear. Clear cut cardio in the brain, Normal structural heart. 
other ten are all normal. When you have an A system in the implantable loop recorder, it's pacemaker. So, but the problem is when the patient is very young, sometimes we might not want to implant the pacemaker because pacemaker we know that we will not want to remove. And you might need to change the pacemaker box every 10 years. So 40 years old, if you change every 10 years, maybe the patient will have a four or five pacemaker in the lifetime. Changing pacemaker is not a problem. The problem is the wire that leads. After about the, the third decade, about 30 years, the wire start giving problem. And uh, the, the lead may be fractured, uh, insulation may break, and you might need to change the lead later on. Uh, the short-term problem would be, of course, the infection of the devices. So there might be a lot of problems in young patient. So anybody that is probably older, let's say like the earlier cases, 70 years and above, no issue. La. I mean, pacemaker is certainly the first line. Well, for this patient, we discuss uh, in the, the option for her. So of course, I still offer a pacemaker because that's the most simplest uh, option. The second is a new therapy called a CNA. So what is a CNA? So next slide. So a CNA, next slide. CNA is a short term for cardioneural ablation. So basically what we do is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these neurocardio, uh, neurocardiogenic syncope, the nerve from the brain actually innervate the heart through all these parasympathetic and sympathetic ganglion, and it's mostly at the atrial wall. Interestingly, many years ago, when we started doing atrial fibrillation ablation, we noticed that we hit this ganglion plexi uh, accidentally because it's very near to the area that we ablate atrial fibrillation. And after that, the patient become more tachycardic a bit for a while. Uh. Then, three years, about three to four years back, the, the EP community have been more interested because by locating all these ganglionic plexi and you are blading, you're able to alleviate the symptoms of neurocardiogenic syncope. So this has been discussed with the patient and the patient is agreeable for this procedure because the patient do not want any implantable devices for it at this point. So next, I'm going to be very brief because this is a bit more uh, advanced, but it's very interesting because it's a new concept. Uh, March 2022, we did the first new uh, cardio neural ablation. The small, small dot uh, in the, yeah, the, all the small, small dot are the area that we ablate the black side, the, the left superior gangrene black side, inferior gangrene black side. Basically, most of the upper black side we ablated, and the patient remains symptom free for seven months. Not only symptom free, the loop recorder itself is the evidence that the patient responds because there's no more bradycardic episode for the next seven months. But interestingly, it recurs the symptom in November 2022. Again, pause, but it's not that uh, not that long. It's about eight seconds, but the patient uh, have a brief symptom. We, we discuss again whether the patient wants a pacemaker because the first one has, have not been, uh, has returned, I mean, basically. But the patient actually agreeable then completion. Now what happened is because this procedure is rarely done, in fact, it's our first cardioneural ablation. We are not too sure whether to ablate very aggress aggressively or not. The first ablation, we only ablate the upper part. Now the problem is the lower part of the atrium, there's still a lot of remaining ganglionite backside, which we ablated and patients think uh, symptom free until now, at least for the next three months. Again, no more triggers from the loop recorder, and I hope she do very well after this. So I think for now on, when we approach patient with neurocardiogenic syncope, this is usually the option I give to the patient, either pacemaker or a new cardio neural relation if the patient is very young. So I would just going to wrap up in summary uh, all these three cases. The approach to syncope is of course very important history taking. Roughly, it can dichotomize to either cardiac or cardiac. If the painting is uh, related to exertion, then you have to think of a cardiac part of syncope. Painting very brief, less than a few seconds, 
most likely cardiac. Painting loss of consciousness period more than a minute, most of the time is non-cardiac, can be neurological, other causes. But the red flag signs are history of a heart-related problem, heart attack. Palpitation, you know that when you have palpitation and pain, most likely is related to some form of yes. Family history of premature uh, uh, sudden cardiac death will probably point towards uh, uh, genetic syndrome like uh, Hukum, Topic cardiomyopathy, Long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, so on and so forth. And of course, physical examination, we will we'll check the BP lying and standing, see any discrepancy, any uh, evidence of autostatic. Cardiac examination, any murmurs that can point towards aortic stenosis. And the initial investigation, uh, the blood tests, the ECGs, echo, stress test, and also rhythm monitor depends on the frequency of the symptoms. Sometimes we might need to refer to a neurologist if all the tests if initially. Now, if the patients have a single P, so the further, more advanced uh, investigation would be a field table test, uh, EP study, and also insertable group record. There's no point keep on repeating the same test again and again. I've seen patients that have like, 10 total monitoring, but cannot find anything. So I think that's the summary for this uh, topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Ko. And now, in the present time, I'll pass you back to Ellen. Thank you, Dr. Jamala. So uh, what uh, we'll do is uh, look for any questions you have in our uh, YouTube comments. We are not using Slido this time so, uh, because we found that uh, some, you know, it's confusing in two places. So we just stick to YouTube. Uh, the only comments are ask, people asking where to get CBD points <laughs> uh, at the moment. Uh, if you want to know where our playlist for all our previous grand rounds, I'll post it in the comments. It's actually bit.ly, bit.ly slash SJMC grand round. So that's the shortcut which will take you to our YouTube playlist. So all the previous presentations over the last couple of years are there. So you can watch, uh, even though you can't get points. So the points are only uh, when you watch live and you participate, okay? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I said, you, if you want to comment, please uh, use uh, YouTube if any questions. Uh, I have one question for Dr. Ko. Uh, how did the battery last three years for the implantable? I don't know any gadget where the battery can last more than a year. Can, especially when the gadget costs more than 15,000. Okay. <laughs> I think possibly because this, you see, this is a, uh, recorder but it doesn't record every single bit it is triggered so for example you will continuously measure the heart rate mm. so anything falls below this rate it will record so there will be a, a recording inside that that chip anything goes beyond this rate you record so it's not like a bit to bit seven day halter times three six five times three years mm. it's an event triggered activity that's why it runs for three years but still the standby battery life is quite good yeah. yeah, they are using the uh, pacemaker technology. So generally, pacemaker battery itself lasts about 10 years oh, okay. uh, to okay. about 14 years now. So suddenly, it's not the not usual battery that we use. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a triple A battery. <laughs> but it's uh, 16,000 uh, ringgit. So I'm not saying two. Hence, you have to be very selective uh, for certain patients. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So the question was where to get our uh, grand rounds. I just put there again. So go to bit.ly slash SJMC grand rounds and you can view all our previous uh, uh, broadcasts. Okay. I don't think anybody asked anything specifically. Yeah. Just anything. in case they were trying to ask, but they couldn't ask. Yeah. So maybe some listeners will want to ask this question. Why in this case the tube cable is negative? You know, so I just want to raise uh, the thing is that not every time you do a tube table and the tube table turns out to be negative, rules out completely any kind of a neurocardiogenic uh, single P. Because during the tube itself, it depends on whether the patient is well hydrated or not, uh, whether the tube was done in a very quiet room, any any disturbance or any IV line just before the tube. So a lot of factors. So normal tube table doesn't mean the patient is ruled out entirely for good. 
uh, newer cardiogenic therapy. Yep. Excellent. So uh, uh, from the non-cardiologist viewpoint, every time somebody comes in with syncope, we only wondering who to refer to. It's either cardiologist or the neurologist. So in this case, it was quite an interesting series of uh, cardio cardiac uh, syncope. So maybe in our upcoming syncope series, we have neurology and possibly even hematology cost of <laughs> uh, syncope. But anyway, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining and I hope you uh, enjoyed listening to these interesting cases. So we are coming to uh, the end of the session and uh, you can claim your CPD point now by using your MMA app. So uh, the scan QR is now no longer in the top left, it's at the bottom. So you go to your the dashboard and at the bottom you click on scan. And this is the uh, QR code, and you can claim your CBD point. Mm -hmm. Retested, it works, yeah. So, uh, Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel so, uh, and hit the notification bell so that uh, you'll be notified of our upcoming video. So if we, we uh, schedule one for live broadcast, it will be on next next month. We'll have another one, yeah, Dr. Jamala. So we'd like to see all of you there again. And uh, we'll end the session. The, the video will still be there. I think you can still claim the points for another uh, 30 minutes or so. Okay, so the QR code is valid live only for about an hour plus. Okay, so you Thank can you very there. much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Very yeah, case. very interesting. So uh, have a good weekend, everyone, and uh, take care. Bye. Right. Excited myself. Try to read the comment there. I'm going to press the